them, and, and hear you talking, and hear you connecting. You're talking, I'm sure, about what happened last week and what's going on. I want you to think with me about some anticipation building for this worship time today. Music is outstanding today, as I've heard all those leading us in worship, rehearsing and preparing to lead you today. I want you to stand and sing and praise the Lord together when we get to that point in the service today. We're having baptism today. We're baptizing six today, four siblings today. It's going to be a great day of celebrating baptism. And so I want you to be excited about the times we gather in worship, but also some things coming up in the life of our church. Take just a minute and watch these announcements on the screen. Hey everybody, I just want to take a minute and invite you to join us next Sunday, July 24th at 6 p.m. for a Shuckers game. Now we don't have very many tickets left, I think maybe seven-ish, but we can always order more if you let us know. So go ahead and sign up today. You can find it in the loop. It's so easy to sign up. It's $10 per ticket. So just let us know if you want to join us. And if you've already got your ticket or you plan on getting one, I just want to remind you to wear your Gulfport shirt or maybe this one or... Uh, this one. I don't know. We got lots of great shirts, but what's more important is we've got some great people. We're going to have some great fellowship and great community at the Shuckers game. So join us next Sunday, July 24th at 6 p.m. Hope to see you there. As a parent, I was always looking for a place where my kids could learn about the Bible, meet new friends, and have lots of fun. Thankfully, I found Awana. In fact, lots of parents have found Awana. Over the last 60 years, Awana has partnered with churches and parents to raise kids with a lasting faith in Christ. I know my kids love coming to Awana, but you may be wondering, what exactly is Awana? Awana is a ministry for kids, and it's held in a local church. These weekly programs last one and a half to two hours, and it's run by qualified adult and student leaders. Carefully tailored curriculum for each age group takes kids on an exciting journey through the Bible. Weekly memory verses and Bible studies show children how the Bible applies to everyday life. Clubs for kindergarten through sixth grade include three segments, game time, handbook time, and large group time. I am so glad I found Awana in my church. My kids are learning God's word, they're developing a strong faith, and they're having a lot of fun. If you want to dive in and find out more about how the entire Awana program works, visit awana.org forward slash parents or talk to your church's commander to learn how you and your kids can get involved in Awana. We can't wait to see your family at Awana. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for listening and watching and paying attention and making notes. So now that you're in the loop and you know what's going on, get ready for a great time as we worship the Lord together today. If you're a guest with us this morning, we want to invite you now to go ahead and find one of those Connect cards or look online at our church website. We'd love to have a, a record of your visit with us in worship today. Good morning, church family. Would you stand and worship with us now?
Well, that's a way to start worship this morning. Good morning, First Baptist Gulfport. My name is Chris Weir. I am the student ministry associate here at First Baptist Gulfport, and I'm so thankful that you have joined us for worship today. If you are a guest in the room or online, I want you guys to take your phones out, point it to the screen. There should be a QR code. If you're in the room, you will find this card in the back of your seat back pockets in front of you. This is a Connect card. I want to remind you as we're here this morning, we're gathered in this room. This building is not the church. We are the church. We want you to be part of a community, not just part of a service. So what I want you to do, if you are a guest visiting with us, whether it's the first time or if you've been visiting for a while, we want you guys to be a part of the First Baptist Gulfport family. So we need you to fill this card out so that we can get to know you. Hey, and if Christ has called you elsewhere, praise him. But we want you to experience community that Christ has called us to. So we're so excited that you're here this morning. And again, as Dr. Jimmy has already stated, uh, we are celebrating new life in Christ uh, and believers' baptism this morning. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jimmy. Thank you so much, Chris. Hey, church family, can y'all see on the screen? Is there? A, there's going to be a choir. You can be seated. Congregation, you can be seated as well. I did it again. <laughs> I love you guys. I started, to, I started to say something before, but I decided y'all would all get that. So. Thank you, Chris, for the great welcome that you always do. And look, let, let me say, you can help us with this. So if you're a guest today, you just heard Chris ask you to take the card, the Connect card, it's in the pockets, and fill that out. We have a competition going on staff to see which one of us gets the most of you guests to fill out that card. Last Sunday, I had a goose egg. I did the welcome and got zero. So I'd like for you to help Chris win today by, as a guest, filling out a guest card, and when the offering plates are passed, you put that in there, you can support Chris in that way and give him something to get over on me about. So, we're getting ready to baptize, and what we do, and this is Jackson Randall, what we do here at First Baptist Church Scuff Fort, because our baptistry is here on the floor, is we allow friends and family to come and stand in support of the person being baptized. We have six candidates today. You see names on the screen? Are they all up there? There's that list. So if you see somebody's name up there that you know, or you know one of Jackson's kids, would you come now with me and stand up here around the baptistry area? Slide over to your right as much as you can so we can make sure this camera shot can get the candidate as we're baptizing them. And Jackson, come on, Jackson. There you go, brother. Y'all come on up here and stand close. There you go, brother. You got it. You didn't need a hand, did you? So, Jackson, we're going to let you step down on that next step down and then just sit back on that top step. It's going to come up high, but it's going to be, there you go. That's good. Makes the baptism easier, and your dad's going to help me with that. So, this is Jackson Randall, son of Jackson, or whom I grew up calling Jax. So, good to see all of you family and friends gathered around here in support of his baptism. I'm going to ask, I ask questions of those who are being baptized, but I prep everybody with the answers. Uh, I'm going to ask him a little bit differently today. I'm doing something different. So, Jackson, who are you trusting for salvation? Jesus, Jesus that's right. And who are you going to follow for the rest of your life? Jesus. That's right. And who are you going to point people to so that they can have salvation in life as well? Jesus. There you go. So, it's my honor to baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father who loves you, His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for you, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. You ready? Yes. All right, Dad. We're buried with Christ in baptism. We're raised to walk in new life with Him. Amen. Woohoo! Come on, brother. Salt. So we like for folks to take a little salt and touch it to their tongue. Jackson, if you'll get it from your dad just a little bit. Just to remember what Jesus said about being the salt and light of the world. And you take this candle, sir, and, let, and keep that candle. All right. Now we have sister coming. Sweet Henley Barton. Yeah. Henley, how, remind me how old you are. Ten. Ten. That's so sweet. There you go. You almost under. I'm going to hold you up like, whoa. <laughs> Look, you stand up. Stand up on that top step. And that way, Jackson can help me. Now, we're going to have to work harder to lower her in the water, but that's not a problem. Then everybody, look out there and see where everybody can see you smiling and take your picture. I hear a clicking of a camera. So, I'm going to ask you, Miss Henley, so who are you trusting for salvation? And who are you going to follow for the rest of your life? Jesus. And who are you going to point other people to for life and salvation? Jesus. That's exactly right, Jesus. So it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father who loves you. 
His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. Are you ready? Take a deep breath. We're buried with Christ in baptism, and we are raised to walk in new life with Him. <laughs> I was wondering if her watch was going to say she's fallen. She's got an Apple watch on. Get you a little salt yeah, and, a, and a candle. Sweet girl. All right, who's, Reese is next. Come on, Reese. Be careful. There you go. Now, you're going to stand on that second step. Do you want to sit down? You'd be more comfortable standing up. Okay. okay. That was an okay to that. Very good. So, Reese, who are you trusting for salvation? Jesus. And who are you going to follow for the rest of your life? Jesus. And who are you going to point other people to for life and salvation? Jesus. That's exactly right. So, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father who loves you, His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for you, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Are you ready? All right, Jackson. We're buried with Christ in baptism. We're raised to walk in new life with Him. You okay? Do you need the towel a little bit? Here, right here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay. I think that was a combination of me helping you back and you weren't ready. You were ready. She, got, she swallowed a little bit of the jacuzzi water. Okay. That's, I know, it's strong, but you won't forget it either, will you? All right. God, God bless you, sweet girl. All right, Miss Ansley. Ansley, last but not least at all. Yes, and look, I want you to stand right there on this top step and, and shake my hand like this. All right, so who are you trusting for life and salvation? And who are you going to follow for the rest of your life? That's, all, that's awesome. And who are you going to point other people to for life and salvation? That's right. So it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father who loves you, His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for you, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. You ready? All right. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And we're raised to walk in new life with him. <laughs> I wanted to get her all the way in there. That's beautiful. Yeah, you can do that. Just to the tip of your tongue. Yeah, I know. I'm, the, your kids don't like salt, do they, Jackson? Okay, it's all good. <laughs> good girl. No, it's all. Oh, on fries. That's so good. What a beautiful day it was when I had all of those kids. And, and parents in the office that day it was a great day of celebrating with all four of them. All right, me and Annie. So we have a special treat today. Warren, you coming? Where are you? There you are, brother. Come on. Thank you, Jackson. So I want you to sit on that first step. Hold my hand. Help me get down there. So Annie and her friend Kyla, who's going to be next, were at camp, and they talked to Chris Weir about baptism. And so I'm so excited for Annie our day to be here for baptism. And how, what a cool day it is, not only for Annie to be baptized, for her dad to help me, but for her grandparents to be watching from South Africa, it's 5.30 or so in the afternoon there. So we have the R Days and the McGee's watching live stream because they want to see. You didn't know that. I could tell by your face you didn't know that. So it's exciting for me to baptize you. I'm so proud of both you and Kyle and others in our student ministry. Annie, who is it that you're trusting for life and salvation? And who is it that you're going to follow for the rest of your life? And who are you going to point other people to for life and salvation? Jesus. Amen. It's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father who loves you, His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for you, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. You ready? All right, Warren, come help me. We're buried with Christ in baptism, and we're raised to walk in new life with Him. It's beautiful. Salt. Here, use this one. Use that one. Annie, you did great, girl. You all right? <laughs> Look, let me tell you about that. I've seen more faces sour and pucker up standing right there. Come on in, Kyla. But you know what I've seen in their faces as they've touched their tongue with the salt is a reminder that when we tell other people about Jesus, it's supposed to, it may not make them pucker up, but to be salt in the world, people are going to know that we're there. They're going to know what we believe. They're going to know that we love them. They're going to know that we care. Salt and light. Light makes a difference. Salt makes a difference. When we are thinking about being salt and light in the world today, we're to make a difference in the world for Jesus. Kyla, I'm excited to baptize you today. We've been, I've been waiting about four years for this since we first talked about your baptism, so this is exciting for me. And I know it is for your fam, family and your parents, and I'm excited Chris is going to help me baptize you. Kyla, who is it that you're trusting for life and salvation? And who is it that you're going to follow for the rest of your life? 
And who is it that you're going to point other people to for life and salvation? I believe that with all my heart for both of you girls. So it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father who loves you, His Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life for you, and the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Ready? We're buried with Christ in baptism, and we're raised to walk in new life with Him. Wow. Salt. Just do that one. Yeah. And then I've asked Chris if he would lead in a prayer for these young ladies as he leads our student ministry and them. So let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you are so, so good. And I just thank you for uh, Annie, for Kyla, for the Randall family. God, that you are at work in the life of your people. And so, Father, we thank you that we can look at baptism and see this beautiful picture of dying uh, with Christ and being raised to walk in newness of life. Father, I just pray that as we uh, celebrate today these baptisms, Father, that you would remind us you have called us to be salt and light. Those are two things that cannot be missed, right, as we see the, the looks on children's faces as they put the salt to their tongue, Father, that, that when people see us, they know that we're there. Uh, and, Father, you know, we've called us to be light uh, in the world that we live in. And so, Father, I just pray that you would use uh, Kyla, use Annie, use the Randall family, and use us to bring forth the hope that we have in you uh, to the world that you've called us to live in. So we love you. We thank you most importantly for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Church, would you put your hands together one more time in celebration of what God's doing here today? It's such a good thing. Church, go ahead and stand. A couple reasons. One, help all, the, all of these people. I think half of you are down here, but all of these people get back into their rows. But also, we're going to continue in worship now. And it isn't it a wonderful thing that the God that saved us, that saved them, he's still working and he's still fighting for us even today. Let's sing When All I See Is The Battle. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
church family. I just wanted to share a verse with you as we go into this time of giving. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 through 8. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As we enter in this time of giving, we're reminded that we serve a faithful God who is here for us. And in each season, no matter what we're walking through, we are called to trust him and give faithfully. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you're doing. I pray, Father, that you will just be with us as we give, Father, that you have given so much to us. and. We just pray, Father, that as we give back to you, that we will be just t- take a moment, Father, to just be with you and, and be reminded of all that you've done for us and that we can just give back to you. And for we're just reminded of your thankfulness and your faithfulness to us, Lord. We love you and we praise you in this time in your name. Amen. stand and continue to sing now, Father, we pray that you would hear our prayers and that you would accept our worship.
chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. It says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing them. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. And to him be the glory forever. Amen. Church, let's sing this together. We sing all these things.
towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Everyone, what a great day of worship we've had. Wouldn't you agree? My goodness. I'm so excited about what God is doing in the life of First Baptist Church Gulfport. And I know that he intends even more for us. So this past summer, or over the summer, we've been going through this series, Encounters with Jesus. And so we're in week number four this morning. As we walk through this series together, we started by looking at the reliable Christ. We opened up the Gospel of John in that first chapter. We saw together that Jesus is indeed God. And that there was something significant about the event of him arriving in that manger over 2,000 years ago. And then living a perfect life. And going to death, his death on that cross. And then taking up his life again three days later. And living even to this day. And of course he is the light of the world. And that light shines through all of us who are his followers. And then the second week we looked at the unifying Christ. As we looked at the high priestly prayer together in John 17, we could see that Jesus in that prayer as he was facing the cross prayed for, yes, those immediate disciples that were surrounding him, but he was praying for each one of us as well, all of us that are his followers in this room. He was praying that we would be one, that together we'd be on mission for him so that we could glorify God together, so that we could make him known. And that's what this church is all about. That's what the church, big church, is all about. It's about making Jesus the Christ known to all of humanity. And then last week, we opened up John chapter 4. And it's there that we saw the accepting Christ together as Jesus encountered that Samaritan woman at the well. How she'd been through so much. And we saw together that Jesus knew who this woman was. Oh, he knew the intimate details of her life. Yet, he embraced her. He knew what she was facing. And he was for her. Not in a condemning way. Not in a guilt-inducing or shame-creating way. But in a loving and accepting way. And so... This morning, we're going to open Matthew's Gospel. So for the last three weeks, we've been looking at the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9. If you have your scriptures, you can open there to Matthew chapter 9. As together we look at the compassionate Christ. And I want to tell you right up front that my goal for this morning's talk is that if you are in the room or you're listening, participating online, and you've not yet come to that place of encountering the compassionate Christ, that this morning you'd receive a touch from him, just like the people that we're going to see in Matthew chapter 9 did. Oh, you don't have to check your, your, your mind at the door. I know there's some skeptics in the room. There's some doubters. I want you to relax. You are welcome here. Your questions and all, because we've been praying for you. We're anticipating you being here with us this morning, and we're asking that the compassionate Christ would reach out and would touch you just like he did so many in Matthew 9 and throughout the span of his life and ministry here on planet Earth. That's my first goal, that if you've not yet been touched by this compassionate Christ, that through what we look at this morning, that by his spirit and through his word and because his people in this room are praying for you, that you would encounter him in a life-changing way. A second goal is this. Maybe you've encountered the compassionate Christ But your compassion has grown a little cold. You see, that word, compassion, literally means to be moved in the deepest part of your stomach, to have a physical reaction to the needs of people around you. Jesus, he was moved in that way because of our need. And all of us who receive that touch from him are called to be a people who demonstrate that compassion. And the reality is that in our lives as followers of Jesus, we can all too often allow our hearts to grow cold to the needs of those around us. And oh, how I pray that through our time in the scripture, 
you'll see this compassionate Jesus and you'll remember the compassion that he had for you and that you'll desire to demonstrate compassion to those around you, that you'll desire that he would demonstrate his compassion through you because that's what we're called to do. So as we look at this, these encounters with Jesus, the compassionate Christ, I want to just kind of give you a quick uh, overview of Matthew chapter 9 because it's absolutely amazing all the, the miracle working that we encounter as Jesus is going about his life and ministry. It, it opens up in, in verse 2 of, of Matthew 9 with Jesus being presented a paralyzed man. We don't know much about this man's story. I don't know, was he paralyzed from birth? Was there an accident? We're not sure, but we know is that his friends heard that Jesus was healing people and they got their friend to Jesus. And we read this in Matthew 2, that Jesus said this when he encountered that paralyzed man. He said, be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now you might find that strange at face value, right? Here's this man who, who heard that Jesus had been healing, physically healing people, was brought to Jesus by his friends, and the first pronouncement of Jesus to him was that he should be encouraged that his sins were forgiven. So there was a theology that was pervasive in the day of Jesus. It was what we might call a health and wealth theology today. You see, there was this idea that if you're walking right with God, then your life is going to be okay. You're going to have health and wealth. And we don't know this about this man, but I just wonder if part of his story was that he bore the shame of being a paralyzed man. And so others around him in this very religious community were judging him because he was paralyzed. There must be something wrong in his life. So Jesus said, be encouraged. Friend, I want you to know, first of all, that your sins are forgiven. There's no guarantee that a follower of Jesus, that any of us who've been touched by the compassion of Christ and are, are following Him or being obedient to Him, there's no guarantee that the side of heaven that we'll have health, that everything's going to be okay. And if we don't have health, it doesn't mean that God is punishing us. And oh, Jesus' pronouncement caught the attention of the religious people of His day. Because reading... Further, in Matthew 9, we see that they were indignant that this man, Jesus, would be a blasphemer because only God could forgive sins. See, they weren't recognizing that Jesus was indeed the God-man. We don't see any indication that they spoke that out loud. So here again in Matthew 9, we see indication of the divinity of Christ because he knew what they were thinking. And so his response to them was, oh, so you're troubled that I would extend forgiveness of sin to this man. So would it help you to see this man get up and walk? Well, I I'm going to heal him then. And he told the man to get up and walk. And the scriptures say that he jumped up and ran home. A miracle of Christ. Yes, a literal, physical healing. This man had encountered the compassionate Christ. His sins were forgiven. And he received healing. Well, again, there are just so many acts of compassion by Jesus in Matthew 9. I just want to quickly catalog them for you. You see, it's in Matthew 9 that we're introduced to the Apostle Matthew, who was a tax collector. And if you're in the room and you, you are a leader of Vacation Bible School or one of our, our kids or students that went through VBS, you know that we talked about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, together. And we know that tax collectors were despised in this culture because they were representatives of Rome. And after all, the Romans were holding the, the, the Jews captive, right? The boot of Rome was on the necks of the Jews. And the taxation was far more severe than anything we've ever seen here in the U.S. And not only was the taxation severe, but you see these tax collectors who were representatives of Rome, these Jewish tax collectors, who were representatives of Rome, they took a cut. The IRS agents of Jesus' day were not men that were looked up to. And so in Matthew 9, we see Jesus encountering Matthew, this tax collector. 
And this is the compassion that he extended to Matthew. He said, I want you to come and follow me to be one of my disciples. You see, Jesus extends his compassion to the most unlikely of people. And if all of us would be honest before a holy God, all of us are unlikely people to have the compassion of Christ extended to. So that's part of the mercy, the grace that he offers. He extends this compassion. And we must come to that place of recognizing our need for it. So Matthew, receiving this compelling call from Jesus, started to follow Jesus. And you know what? Matthew did something that I've seen a lot of adult converts do. You know, many of us have had the privilege of coming to Christ as children. And so by God's grace, we're, we're, we've been preserved in that salvation. And we grow up in the church. And we don't have these dramatic salvation or conversion stories. And that's okay. Praise God for that. But oh, how I love the testimony of adults who come to Jesus. Who they have a BC, a before Christ story. And, and, and that story is not one that they're often proud of. But oh, wow, they encounter the compassionate Christ. And he revolutionizes their lives. And then their after Christ story. It's really a story of the testimony of God's grace at work in their lives. And, and, and these adult converts, maybe you're one. They can't help. They can't wait to share this compassion they receive from Christ with others. It's such a beautiful thing to see. So Matthew, the tax collector, he did what we see lots of adult converts do. He threw a party because Jesus was with him. And he wanted others to meet this compassionate Christ. And so he invited other tax collectors to the party. He invited other non-religious Jews to the party. And you know what? Jesus once again encountered the ire of the religious authorities. And this is what he had to say. I didn't come for those that think they're well. I've come for those that need the compassion of God. And that is one of the barriers for many to encountering the compassionate Christ is coming to that place of surrender, recognizing the need for His mercy, for His compassion. Because all of us are sinners far from God. None of us can do enough to measure up to God on our own. And that is such a stumbling block. Maybe it's a stumbling block for you in the room or online this morning. It's my hope that by God's Spirit and through His grace and through the Word that we're working through this morning, you come to that place of recognizing that you need the compassion of Jesus. Matthew did. And he introduced his friends and family to this same compassionate Christ. The miracles aren't done yet. You see, right after that, Matthew party, we see Jesus encountering a, a religious leader, a leader from the synagogue. In Matthew 18, uh, 9, verse 18, this is what he said. I just can't imagine the tenderness of this moment. He said, my daughter has just died. Have you been with someone who's lost a child? There is no greater grief. Some of you in this room have lost a child. You know that grief. Jesus encountered this man who had lost his daughter. He said, I need your help. She's died, but you can bring her back to life. So Jesus immediately began to travel to her house. And as he set out on the road to her house, like I said, there's, there's so much. There's, this, this, this chapter is so rich. We hear that he, he began his journey toward that religious leader's house. And a woman who'd had an issue of blood for 12 years reached out and touched the hem of the garment of Jesus. 
Again, sometimes we don't recognize what a big deal this was and is in our culture. But see, that woman in Jewish culture would be considered unclean because of her sickness. Jesus was recognized as a rabbi, a practicing Jewish male. And so she respected the law. She didn't touch his person. But she was taking a risk. She was demonstrating her faith by reaching out to touch his garment. And we see such compassion from Jesus. Because he turned around and he looked at her. You know, I, I think that is one way that Jesus shows compassion to every one of us. Is he notices us. He looked at her. And he said, your faith has made you whole. And so then he carried on to that religious leader's house and, and again demonstrated his miraculous power by bringing that daughter who was dead back to life. Yes. You ask, Eric, do you really believe that happened? I do. You see, I believe that we have a reliable record of the life and ministry of Christ through the Gospels. There's scholars that, that talk about how histories in the day of Jesus uh, were put together. And, and there's something absolutely unique about these Gospels. You see, we have people that we, we, we know their names and they were eyewitnesses to what Jesus did. And they, they, throughout the rest of their lives, talked about these miracles that they saw Jesus perform. There were eyewitnesses to the death of Jesus on the cross. The women were there when Jesus was placed in the tomb. And so, so you see, there were many witnesses that talked about the, these things. They saw the resurrected Jesus. And so by virtue of their eyewitness accounts, we have these Gospels. So yes, that young woman was brought physically back to life by Jesus. And the miracles, they're not done yet. Because right after he raised that girl from the dead, he encountered two blind men who were shouting, Son of David, have mercy on us. So these blind men recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited, anointed one that had been promised so long ago by the prophets had arrived. And so Jesus healed those blind men. He touched them on the eyes. and He said, because of your faith, it will happen. And then there's just one more miracle. I said, this, this, I think this chapter has one of the most dense concentrations of the compassion of Christ that we see in any of all the Gospels. You see, a demon-possessed man who couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. And the Scriptures say that Jesus cast out the demon and the man began to speak. And the crowds were amazed. These people encountered the compassionate Christ. The good news is the compassionate Christ is still being encountered today. And so I want to spend the next few minutes just looking at uh, verses 35 through 38 together as we see how this might just apply to our lives. I want you to first of all see in, in, in Matthew 9 verse 35. Just read that again, verses 35 and 36. That's what God's Word says. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. We just walked through those healings. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So I want you to see from these two verses, in verse 36 in particular, that compassion, the compassion that physically moved Jesus, sees. Compassion. Christ-like compassion. The compassion that Jesus demonstrates toward us is a compassion that sees he saw the crowds they were harassed and confused like sheep without a shepherd that word harassed literally means to be mangled to be torn apart to be cut to the bone the word helpless 
me to throw to the ground. Jesus, he saw the needs of all these people. And he was moved with compassion. See, they were people that were deceived. People that were hurt, betrayed, abused, torn apart, beat down, had been discarded by culture. Jesus saw them. See, the people who've been seen compassionately by Christ, we too, are to cultivate this ability to see. To really see the needs of the people around us. And there are layers of need. I think the supreme need that all of us have, apart from Christ, is to be born again. See, the Scripture says that all of us are, are dead in our trespasses and sins. See, there's a spiritual deadness by virtue of really our first birth, by arriving on planet Earth. And it's only through Christ's grace, His compassion demonstrated toward us that we receive, that we're made spiritually alive. And so that is, is, I think, the most significant compassion that we all must cultivate as followers of Jesus is to see the need, the true need. But it can't just be a, a spiritual exercise. I mean, Jesus physically met the needs of people around him even as he proclaimed the good news of the arrival of the kingdom, even as he shared the gospel. He met practical needs. And he is our example. And I think that for all, all of us that are followers of Christ, that are evangelical Christians, that would be most of us, right? That's how we would label ourselves as members of First Baptist Church Gulfport, is that we must first and foremost see the spiritual needs of the people around us and, be, and see that and be moved with compassion toward them. We're far too guilty at times of demonizing those around us because of their political views or their moral persuasions. Because they, they have a lifestyle that is, is not lining up with the Scripture. And I think all these things are important. We are people of the book. But compassion sees. And how it's my prayer that His people known as First Baptist Church Gulfport really see the needs of the people that we encounter. That we won't pass judgment, but that we'll demonstrate compassion. That we'll look to enter into some difficult conversations. Maybe you say, I, yeah, I, I, see, I see the need, but I don't know how to engage in conversation. Well, that's part of our responsibility as your leaders here at the church is to help equip you. And I'm telling you, on September the 11th, we're going to begin a, a, a class. I'm going to lead it on Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. 12 questions that, that are confronting us as Christians that we must be able to answer. So if you're not doing anything on Sunday nights, starting September 11th, I'd love for you to join me for a 12-week study through these questions. Because we want to engage the culture around us compassionately when we see the need. But seeing isn't enough. You see, if we look at the example of Jesus, we see not only did He see the need but that he served those around him. Verse 37. He said to the disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Compassion serves. Compassion is not just spoken. Although words are important. Compassion serves. You see all the way through Matthew 9 and really the gospel accounts of Jesus' encounter with people, encounters with people. He served them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. You see, workers. Workers for Christ serve humanity, serve one another. And there are lots of ways that we can serve. And I think that serving, seeing the need, and then serving is a way that we can open up conversation and witnessing opportunities. What are some ways that you can serve? It doesn't take a church program. And maybe you're doing this, and I commend you. Babysit for a single mom. We have some in our fellowship. Visit someone who's sick 
or homebound. Feed someone who's hungry. Serve that person that you're thinking of right now because you know they need your help. And you know what that service looks like. Maybe you need to get out your checkbook and demonstrate some generosity. Serve them. Maybe you need to offer your taxi services to that person. See, compassion sees. Compassion also serves. And oh, don't end there, right? If you're part of this fellowship, so members of First Baptist Church Gulfport, this is for you. There's a place for you to serve here. Oh, Eric, you go in there, yes. Because God's called you to this fellowship. He has a place of service for you. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. He gifts us. He supernaturally gives us spiritual gifts. Why? So that we might strengthen the body to the glory of God. So if you're not serving somewhere, you need to serve to strengthen this, your church. I said, I don't know how to get started. Well, thank you for your honesty. I don't have a slide for this. But, you know, we, we love that uh, text responder around here, right? So you can jot this down or you can go ahead and get your phone out right now. So if you're thinking you need to serve, I'd love for you to just get your, get your phone out. And if you would text the message serve, S-E-R-V-E, serve, to 228-265-5020, you'll, you'll, you'll get a, a, a link that will show you all the places you can serve with a little form. If you fill that form out, I get that. And I will call you personally to help you find a place of service. Now, if you're already serving, I know how this works, right? If you're already serving, that book, what I just said was not intended for you. You don't need to serve somewhere else. You need to go ahead and make room for others that are gifted here in our church family to serve. It's a compassion. The compassion of Jesus that he so clearly demonstrated to the people he encountered, sees, it serves. And I want you to note also that in his instruction to those first followers, this is what he said when he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. He said, so pray the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. So you know our first response to the needs that can see, seem so overwhelming is to pray and to pray specifically that God would send workers. That's a discipline I'm engaged in. And you know what? I, I see a harvest coming. Do you? I, I see we, we've come through COVID together and more than ever, our community, we don't even have to go global. I don't have to pan any further out than the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Our community needs the hope of the gospel. And they'll receive this hope as we see the needs that are out there and as we serve and as we pray that the Lord of the harvest would enlist workers into the harvest. I'm expecting him to do some wonderful things through this specific local church family as we demonstrate the compassion of Christ to those around us and through the big C church across our coast. Because what this world needs is the hope that only Jesus offers. Pray, pray that God will send workers. Recognize the task is bigger than you. You can't do it on your own. We can't do it on our own. We need God's help. In a way that we demonstrate our dependence on God is through a spirit and attitude of prayer. So I told you at the outset that I had this goal, a twofold goal. That if you've not yet seen your need to be touched by the compassion of Christ, that today would be the day. Do you see it? Do you see how Christ was moved by the needs of the people around him? Jesus, he knows what your need is. Your chief need is to surrender to him for relationship to the Father. That's you. In just a few minutes, we're going to give you an opportunity to you can walk the aisles. Chris will actually be back on the gym floor. Pastor Jimmy and I will be right down front. We'd love for you to come tell us, I need the compassionate touch of Jesus. We'll show you how you can know that you've received that touch. Maybe you're in the room, you've been his follower, and your compassion has grown a little cold, and you've recognized that you need to open up your eyes so that you're seeing like Jesus. You need to serve. You need to pray. 
You can do business with God right there where you are. Or again, it would help you to just come forward and pray at the altar as kind of just a, a stake in your journey, a, 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 a milestone in your journey with Jesus. Pray. The altar is going to be open. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray together. Father, God, I thank you that you've ordained to work when your people assemble like this. And Father, how good it's been to worship you through song. God, to worship you through the testimony of what you're doing in the lives of our church families. God, thank you for each salvation that was represented by the baptisms that happened today. We praise you again that you have a special plan for each one of these uh, young people. I thank you that you're captivating their hearts, and I pray that that may be so, that in the days ahead, that through your word and through encounters with you and through the discipling they'll receive, that they will so uh, know that you are good and you have a plan for them, that nothing else will captivate them like you, King Jesus. And Father, thank you that by your spirit and through your word, you're still drawing men and women to yourself. I pray for someone in the room that needs to receive the compassion of Christ through salvation, that you will not let him or her rest until that is settled. And God, for all the rest of us, I pray that you would help us to see and to serve and to pray, expecting you to work through us, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. praise, our offerings, our thanksgiving. Thank you for being here today and being a part of this service. Uh, next Sunday, Eric's going to wrap up this series of Encounters with Jesus. What a beautiful series it's been. Uh, we'll start a new series on July the 31st. I want to prep you now that beginning August 1, I want you to read with me, all of us together, the Psalms. One chapter in Psalms a day all the way through the end of the year. I'll tell you more about that as we get ready to launch that new series, Psalms of Life. We'll do that together, Psalms for Life, starting on Sunday, July the 31st. And during the month of August, we're going to have two extra opportunities for baptism. If you, maybe this Sunday morning time is not best for you, for whatever reason, we're going to have a Thursday evening baptism service right here in this room, 6 p.m. Thursday evening, August the 11th. And then on Thursday evening, August the 25th, we'll have our second ever baptism at Captain Al's Beach down on Bernard Bayou. We have done one of those. We'll do another one on August the 25th. So if you are looking to be baptized, looking to follow Christ in believer's baptism, would love to talk to you today before we leave. As we prepare to leave and go out and love one another well, would you watch this brief video? Have a great afternoon.